Can you remember back around, say, nine months ago when somebody wished you Happy New Year? 2020 was going to be your year, right? It has been an interesting year, to say the very least. I think we can all admit that. A uniquely difficult year. I don't know how many of you remember this, but it kind of began with brush fires in Australia. That's a kind of a, uh, an understatement when I say brush fires. Australia was deeply affected. If you, I don't know how many of you watch sports, but the Australian Open, people were having trouble. There were even tennis players that dropped out because they couldn't breathe. The, the smoke was so thick during the play, it was a really terrible thing. And that was just an ominous foreboding of what was to come. On January 7th, the World Health Organization was officially notified about the outbreak of a virus in the Wuhan province of China known as the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. You may have heard about it. It's made the rounds. Uh, this year, of course, is an election year. You may have heard about that as well. Uh, we had an impeachment trial. We had the Iowa caucuses. Made us all proud, didn't it? Uh, to, to know that the world would... Have they ever declared a winner in that yet? I'm not sure. And there is a roiling anger in the electorate on all political sides. We saw the Dow Jones Industrial Average and all the stock market just plunge. I believe it's picked up a little bit. Unemployment soared to levels we haven't seen in our lifetimes. And then our world was shut down. I just stay home, wear masks, things that we haven't really seen. Uh, economic deprivation businesses closed and then in the middle of all this you began to hear about things like swarms of bees and i just thought this one was unfair you remember murder hornets i was like why do we need murder hornets we've had coronavirus and brush fires and all of that and then we have murder hornets fortunately living up in iowa we're a little farther north of their habitat i don't think we have to worry about the murder hornets coming and getting us but uh swarms of bees murder hornets hurricanes and and then of course monday was it august 10th the derecho came through iowa it hit us but it nearly destroyed cedar rapids i mean it really hit them it hurt them badly Nine months ago, nobody except their family and perhaps a few friends knew the names of the people in these pictures. Now you probably do. That's Ahmaud Arbery, that's Breonna Taylor, and that's George Floyd. And their deaths have been etched into our social conscience, and there have been massive demonstrations all over America which have in many cases turn violent parts of our country now have become war zones and people are now looking towards 2021 oh it's all going to be better in 2021 only four months away and everything is going to change as if the turning of the page of a calendar is going to make everything better folks i don't want to burst your bubble but a Changing the calendar from 2020 to 2021 is not magically going to make everything better. And B, the world has always had problems. We've been blessed to live in a nation that has been protected from a lot of the problems that the world has seen. We've often been spared. But in other cultures and throughout history, a lot of the things that we're seeing in this world 
suffering is not that unusual. It has been the norm for God's people to experience hardship and suffering, persecution, martyrdom. These things have not been that unusual all over the world today and throughout time. I want to take you back to a moment in world history, in church history, when the disciples of Jesus Christ were facing a terrible, terrible time in their lives. The night that Jesus addressed them in John chapter 14 through 17. Our text today will be John 17, the next two weeks. You know I've finished up one series and been looking for another one. This is a stopgap. I plan to spend two weeks in John 17, and you know that I always follow through on those plans. Uh, so two weeks in John 17, uh, possibly a third, I don't know, but I, I, I really think we'll, we'll be two weeks in John 17. And then I don't know where we'll go from there. But these men, the disciples, these men and women had accompanied Jesus throughout his ministry, and now they had walked with him into Jerusalem. They had been there when he rode into the city with the highest of expectations in triumph. People shouted Hosanna and they praised Jesus as the one who would come in the name of the Lord. And a few days later, the mood turned. And Jesus taught them in John 14 through 16 how to live when their world was going to explode. We did a series on John 14, 16 a few years ago, and then I hit it again uh, when we were studying the Holy Spirit. I picked out uh, you know, some of the teachings from that. But within the next 24 hours, everything they'd given their lives to would be gone. They followed Jesus. They gave their lives to Jesus and he would be dead, and he would be in a tomb, and a stone would be rolled over that tomb, and soldiers would be guarding it, and everything would be gone. Their lives would hang in the balance. They'd be wondering if the soldiers would be coming for them. And Jesus told them in John 14, 15, and 16 to have peace because he was preparing a place for them, because he was sending the Holy Spirit to empower them, and because the true vine would uh, sustain their lives and so in that upper room he gave them this beautiful discourse about how he would strengthen them and help them send the holy spirit to them and how he had overcome the world and then in john 17 jesus did something absolutely amazing he prayed for his disciples now the, I don't know what to call it, irony, the, uh, the mind-boggling aspects of the Son of God, the Creator Himself, praying to the Father. It, it's, it's, it's odd. I, I don't understand all of the dynamics of this. But the simple fact is Jesus prayed. This prayer has sometimes been called the farewell prayer, the farewell discourse, and then the farewell prayer, the true Lord's prayer the high priestly prayer. Uh, it's assumed that Jesus prayed this in front of all of his disciples, but we don't have a lot of the details about it. He preached to them. He put into their minds the truths they needed as they faced the days ahead, but then he did much, much more than that. As the hour of their greatest trial came on them, Jesus prayed for them. And this is our great blessing today, folks. In 2020 and whether 2021 brings better days or plagues worse than we can imagine this truth strengthens strengthens us rest in this trust in this rely on this and hear this clearly my friends Jesus prays for you he prays for you I, I am blessed when people come to me and say, Pastor, I've been praying for you. Especially when I, you know, there are people that, you know, say, well, I'll pray for you. And I kind of wonder, well, I don't know if it's real or not. Who knows? But when someone tells me that and I know, and, you know, I know it's, it's real. 
and they're genuinely praying for me. Uh, I'm blessed by that. I don't take it lightly. But whether you pray for me or I'm faithful to pray for you, we have this promise, this blessing that we can rely on every single day. Jesus Christ prays for me. If you're a believer, Jesus Christ prays for you. And that's what John 17 is all about. It's about Jesus Christ praying for us. In this passage, Jesus pours out his heart to the Father and he prays for his disciples. He begins in, uh, in the first five verses praying for himself and then in verse 9 he tells his disciples that he is praying for them he says in verse 9 he says i pray for them he's talking to his father he says i pray for them now he's talking here specifically in context about the disciples the people who were sitting around him the people who were listening he's saying i'm praying for them not the whole world but just for my disciples, those you have given me, because they belong to you. He cared for these men, and he interceded to the Father for them. But it wasn't only for them. He made it clear, moving down the passage in verse 20, he says, I pray not only for these, but I pray for those who will believe in me through their word. So he says, I'm going to pray for myself. There's one prayer for himself. And then he says, I'm going to pray for these disciples. And then he says, now I'm praying for all who will come after them. Everyone who will believe in me because of what my disciples will preach. This wasn't a one-time thing either. In the Mount Everest of Scripture, in Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us, that we have a one-two punch of intercessions. Interesting, the Bible says where two are agreed on anything, uh, it, it comes to pass. Remember that? Where, you know, if, the, if two agree, well, there's two praying for us in that very chapter. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. It says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should now that's startling admission we often don't even know what to pray for i don't know how to pray for people a lot of times we're praying lord take this terrible thing from me or take this terrible thing from that person and god has a different purpose we don't understand the purposes of god right we're like, God, take away coronavirus. And God's got a different purpose. He wants us to learn lessons while the coronavirus rages on. We're like, God, give me all these, these things. And God says, maybe I want you to learn how to live life when you don't have things. I, mean, I don't know. I'm just saying God has different purposes than we do. And he says, we don't know what to pray for. But the Spirit intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints. By the way, you realize that when the Bible talks about the saints, it's not talking about this class of super holy people. Like my dad used to say, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the saints and the ain'ts. He used to be mean about it. He'd say, how many saints do we have here? And of course, almost no one would lift their hands because they didn't want to say, well, I'm a saint. He'd say, well, then let me share the gospel with the rest of you. Because the word saint in the Bible always refers to every person who has been born again by the grace of God. Every person who has been saved. It doesn't refer to a special class of holy people. It refers to all believers. Uh, so the saints he intercedes for the saints according to the will of god god's holy spirit within us is interceding for us with inexpressible groans now there have been volumes written about these inexpressible groans and what they are but we know that the holy spirit works within us to help us know what to pray and when our hearts are broken 
when we're so stressed out, so sad, so upset that we don't even know what to pray. Our minds can't focus. He is still working within our spirits with these unutterable groans to speak to God on our behalf. The Spirit is helping us when we can't help ourselves. And then, verse 34, is one of the great, I mean, just one of the truly high points of Scripture. It's a, if God is for us, who can be against us? And then Paul asks and answers three questions. And one of them is this. Who is the one who condemns? Who has the right to condemn me? Well, Jesus. But instead of condemning me, Christ Jesus is the one who died. See, Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. But instead of condemning me, he died, and even more, he has been raised, and he's at the right hand of God, and he is what? He's interceding for me. And he's interceding for you. He prays for us and intercedes to the Father on our behalf. How great is that? How great is it that inside of us, the Spirit of God is helping us know what to pray and interceding for us with groanings that can't be uttered and seated at the right hand of God the Father is Jesus Christ praying for you. So world, do your worst. 2020, throw your curveballs at us. Throw your 103 mile an hour fastballs at us. Make life miserable because we are secure in Christ and the Holy Spirit is interceding and Jesus Christ is interceding. He prays for me. What can the world do to me? If God is for me, who can be against me? And when the world rages, I know that my Savior is on my side and He's seeking my spiritual progress and prosperity in the midst of all of this. What a great blessing to know. What a comfort to know that Jesus Christ prays for me. How can there be any greater blessing than this? To know that Jesus is praying for us. But it's more than just a comfort. It is a great instruction to us. It is a, it's something we need to learn from. My dad used to say, and I, Please stick with me, because I'm not trying to be mean here, but my dad, I'm, I'm talking about my dad a lot here today, but my dad used to say that a lot of our prayer meetings come out like organ recitals. You know what I mean by that? Organ recitals. Let's pray for Mrs. Smith's liver and Mr. Jones's spleen, and we, you know, we, pray, for, we pray for everybody's internal organs. And all we do is pray for sick people. Now, should we pray for sick people? nod your head yes that is actually a godly thing to do praying for physical healing and hurting people is absolutely a part of praying and we shouldn't stop doing that but the sad fact is that in most of our prayer times we never move beyond that there are two lessons that we can learn from this passage the first i've already shared with you we can walk in confidence knowing that Jesus is, you are prayed for. If I said that I was going to devote the next week, morning, noon, and night to praying for you, would that bless you? Maybe it would. Well, I'm telling you that the Spirit of the living God and the Son of God, your Savior, is praying for you morning, noon, and night, and He doesn't get tired. He doesn't take breaks. He doesn't sleep. They don't. God is for you. Nothing this world can throw at you compares to the power of God at work inside of you. Do not fear the evil of this world. Walk confidently in this world. God is for you. Jesus is praying for you. So don't fear the evil. Don't get wrapped up. Oh, I hate it when Christians get wrapped up in conspiracy theories as if evil men run the world and we ought to be afraid. I said this a few weeks ago when we were still studying the end times. 
if when you think about the end times you think about the evil things that evil people are doing and it makes you afraid you're doing it wrong because it's all about Jesus Christ and the glory of the living God and his victory don't be afraid don't get wrapped up in nonsense because our God works all things for the good of those who love him you can live confidently and gain comfort when Jesus Christ is your prayer warrior did you hear that Jesus Christ is your prayer warrior but there's a second truth and this is really the basis took me all this time to get to the basis of my message the next this week and next week if you want a powerful prayer life pattern your prayers after Jesus prayers what Jesus prayed for you should pray for let his prayers be the pattern for your prayers last September and October we were having a small group emphasis and I gave eight weeks I think it was eight sermons on prayer I believe it was eight sermons I could go back and count and what I want to do is add to that and take a couple now, what I mostly focused on I think five or six of those weeks were the things that hinder prayer things we can do that hinder our prayers from being answered what I want to do to today to begin today and to take on next week are those things that Jesus prayed for as a template for our prayers I'm calling it Jesus prayer list if if we figure out what Jesus prayed for and then we begin to pray those same things doesn't it make sense that our prayers are more likely by the way Jesus healed the sick I, I, I kind of make fun of that because I mean I, the problem is not that we pray for the sick it's that we stop there so that's all we do but there is such a deeper such a more powerful prayer life that God opens up for us our prayer list needs to be more aggressive more powerful more cosmic if you will we need to go into deeper things than just this person is having surgery and that person is you know is dealing with illness those things are important and we shouldn't stop praying for them but they're only the beginning and so we're going to look at the things that Jesus prayed for things that matter in eternity and our prayer lives will be more powerful if we pattern our prayers after the things that Jesus prayed for so what we're gonna look at in Acts 17 is five specific prayer requests that Jesus made and hopefully they'll become a template for your prayers now there is so much depth in John 17 I uh, if you want to learn about the interaction of the persons of the Trinity I mean I could spend weeks just exploring how the Father and the Son relate there's not as much in this chapter about the Spirit you got to look back in John 14 and 15 and 16 to see that but there's so much depth about the Father and the Son and I mean I can like I said I could I could get lost for weeks talking about the uh, the, the the you know the Father and the Son and how they relate we don't have time to do that I'm going to I'm not going to go verse by verse I'm not going to develop every deep thought from this I'm going to look at five specific requests that are on Jesus prayer list and then form a template for your prayer life and so the question is what did Jesus pray for I hope to look at two of these today we may have to stop after one who knows I, but there are five of them that I want you to see the first one is that he prayed that God would glorify himself Jesus prayed that the father would glorify himself in Christ as he completed his mission now just as a little bit of background there is a very simple outline to John 17 different commentators outline it different ways but it's a very simple outline in verses 1 through 5 Jesus prays for himself he makes a prayer request for himself that's the first one we're gonna look at 
Then in verses 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples. And by that I mean the 12, and maybe a few others that were there with them. But he prays for the men who are sitting there in the upper room, listening to what he says. Those 12 disciples, maybe 11 by this time, because Judas has gone to betray him. And then in verses 20 to 26, he prays for all of his disciples, and that includes us, obviously. I'm going to assume that the prayers that he prayed for his first disciples also apply to us today, and I'm going to apply all of these prayers to our prayer life. What I want you to look at now in verses uh, 1 through 5 is the first prayer request Jesus made. Look at John 17, 1 and 2, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. He says, Father, glorify me so that I may glorify you, the Son may glorify you, since you gave him, you gave me authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. He puts this in the third person, but he's saying, he's saying, Father, it's a simple request, Father, glorify me so that I in turn can glorify you. And then verse 2 explains this. It's not just a mutual glorification society. It has a specific purpose. Jesus was given authority so that he could give eternal life to all those that the Father had given to him. So that was basically the simple truths in this passage are, are very clear. He said, I am given authority so that I can bring eternal life to all that the Father has given to me. All those who will one day believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, all those who are part of the church that I will be establishing through the Holy Spirit, I want to glorify the Father by giving them eternal life. And then he says the essence of eternal life in verse 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. The essence of eternal life is knowing God. It's not a religion, uh, just going through religious rituals or duties. It is a knowledge, a personal, intimate relationship, a knowledge of Jesus Christ, of the Father through Jesus Christ. It's knowing them. And then finally, Jesus then glorified the Father by completing the work of redemption that the Father had given him in this world. Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. Now listen, he prayed that he would glorify the Father by completing his mission. Now was there any doubt that Jesus would complete his mission? Well, I guess not really. But we do know that within an hour or two, he would be in the garden praying, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so Jesus was praying, Lord, keep me focused on the mission that you have given me. He came to earth to complete the work the Father gave him. He suffered rejection. He was falsely accused. He endured pain and hurt. He was tortured all the way to the cross where he died for your sins and mine. He fulfilled the mission the Father gave him. Uh, and that was his ultimate purpose. That was why he came. Jesus prayed for himself that he would glorify God and finish the work God gave him to do, which was to redeem a people for God. He was single-minded in every thought, every word, every action. Listen, you see this from the time he was a little boy. His family went to the temple when he was 12. Remember that? And they just had their, their fun time, and they were all headed back up to Galilee, up to Nazareth, and all of a sudden, they, I mean, everybody was just, I mean, I, I think it was just kind of like a big, you know, all of Nazareth kind of wandered down together for the festival, and everybody was wandering back, and all of a sudden, they got a certain ways out, and they realized, hey, where's Jesus? And they went back 
And, you know, Joseph and Mary went back and they found Jesus in the temple, a 12-year-old boy talking to the scribes and the priests, and he was asking them questions. He was learning. Why? Because he was on mission. He wasn't there just to have fun. He was there to accomplish the Father's work. And from the moment that he was baptized, I, we don't know much of what he did between 12 and 30-something, but from the moment he was baptized in the Jordan, he never spent a day other than on the mission of God. He was single-minded, single-hearted. He had one purpose in everything that he did. He was driven by one thing and one thing only. From his nativity until the time of his death and resurrection, he was motivated by the desire to glorify his Father by doing the work the Father gave him to do, which was redeem a people for God. How often did Jesus say something like, my time has not yet come, or the time is come? He was operating on an agenda set by the Father, and he would not be diverted from that agenda. He was going to do what the Father said. So now here's our, you know, that, that's what Jesus did. He, his prayers were focused continually on the mission he had set. So now what about us? While this was Jesus' prayer for himself, we are called to be like Christ, to, to imitate Christ. And so the question that I would have for you today is, what drives you in your life when you get up in the morning what is the driving point of your life what's your goal as you go through the day what is it you're hoping to accomplish as you lay your head on your pillow at night what are you thinking about what are you hoping for some people seek power and glory money control praise of other people pleasure all these things jesus was motivated by a desire to glorify the father and what you need to be praying for for yourself for those you care about for this church and the members in it we need to be praying that god would give us a singular focus in our minds and our hearts on our mission that we would be focused on the task. See, here's the problem, folks. And I, again, I am, I am not trying to be mean today, but I guess I am in a certain sense. For most of us, Christianity is a hobby. It's something we do in our spare time. Is that unfair? For Jesus, it was his life. Remember Paul? He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For most of us, for a lot of us, most, I don't know, Christianity is what we do when we don't have anything else to do. When we can carve out some time, when you pray, ask God to purify your heart so that you will live daily on the mission the Lord has given you, so that your life will glorify God by making a difference in this world. As Jesus devoted himself to the mission of God, pray that your life would be devoted to the mission of God, that our church would be on mission, and that God's people, all of us, would be on mission. Let me just take a moment and go to the second one. You know, I don't have time to do that. That's just, I've, I, uh, yeah, I do. You guys don't have anywhere to be. Jesus prayed for protection for his disciples and for their joy in a hostile world. Jesus was about to leave his disciples and he promised them the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit to enlighten them and empower, empower them. But he knew that the world they would be going into was hostile. See, we think the world should be sympathetic to us. We believe that America 
that our government, our culture, should reflect our values. And that's a great blessing we've had in America is that often at least American culture and Christianity have, have, have swum, swam, swum in the same river. Not always identical, but at least flowing in the same current, headed in the same general direction. But Jesus reminded us that the world is always hostile to Christianity, to the basic tenets of our faith. The world is always going to be a place. He says, the world hated me, and if you live for me, the world will hate you. He says there are going to be false prophets, false teachers, false Christs. And so Jesus prayed for his disciples, and his prayer, though directed at those disciples, is still absolutely true today. He said, Father, Holy Father, protect them by your name. Now this Holy Father is an interesting phrase. I don't have time to get into it, but it comes, interest, it comes back later on in one of the, in the next, the third, uh, when he says, sanctify them by your word, make them holy by your word. But Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me so that we may be one so that they may be one as we are one. The key there is protect them by your name. Jesus realized he was no longer going to be there. He goes on to say, well, I was with them, I protected them, but I'm not going to be here anymore. And they're going to need protection. They're going to need something. He says, I don't want to remove them from the world. I want them in the world. I want them ministering. I want them serving. But Father... I pray that you would protect them. And then, in verse 13, Jesus ratchets things up. You see, we live in a hostile world. It's under the lies of Satan, and, and, and Jesus protects us. But in verse 13, he takes that a step farther. He says, I don't just want to protect them from the world, but I want them, look, he says, now I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so they may have my joy completely in them. My joy in them. As we walk through this sinful world, God does not want you living in fear. God does not want you hunkering down. You know? Preparing for the end. God wants you living confidently, fearlessly, and joyfully. The number one marker of Christian people ought to be joy. Joyful lives. I'm not saying goofy happy all the time. I'm just saying we ought to be joyful everywhere we go. Rejoicing in what Jesus Christ is doing. Rejoicing that Jesus is praying for me. That I can be confident in Him. That whatever comes, I know He's at work in me. In the middle of a hostile world, we know that there is joy to be had. Jesus is praying for me today. He's praying that I'd be protected from Satan and all of His works. From the, powerful, the power of darkness and the works of evil. And he wants me to find joy in the middle of this. In the middle of all of this, he wants me to have his joy. That's Jesus' prayer. He prayed not only that we would be protected, but that we would find joy. So we live in an evil world, wicked world. One which will never love what we believe and what we stand for. Our world system hates us because it's under the lies of Satan. But our God does not leave us alone. He protects us, and when we seek Him, He fills us with joy. So this is our prayer. This is Jesus' prayer. And so ought not it to be our prayer. Lord, protect us from the lies of Satan and his schemes and give us your joy, your peace. Joy that in the darkest of night, in the worst of circumstances, joy that, that sees us through. Peace 
in the middle of the worst of storms and hope that when everything seems to be going wrong, we know that God will see us through. God will make a way. This is what Jesus is praying for. And I believe that if we will begin to pray for one another in all of this, as Jesus prayed, once again, it's good to pray simple, worldly prayers. And by that, I don't mean worldly sinful. I just mean pray for people to find financial provision when they need money, to find healing when they're sick, the, to, to deal with the things of this world. But we need to go a step deeper and begin to pray. I mean, I'm, I'm honest. I think there's, there's a, a couple of huge issues with Christians today. And one is that the average American Christian is not living on mission. Our lives are about our lives. And we do the mission of God in our spare time. Now that's a judgment, that's a generalization. It's not true of everybody, but it's not untrue of enough people. Jesus prayed, Father, focus me on your mission. May I glorify you by completing the task you've given me to do. And I think we need to be praying, thank you that Jesus completed your mission. Now, Lord, may I complete the mission you've put me on the Great Commission, and the personal mission you have for me. And then, Lord, protect me. We live in a, a world of, of sin, and we live under the circumstances of the world. Too often, that's the second thing, Christians live as if our lives are governed by the circumstances of the world. Well, I'm under attack. Hey, listen, when are you not under attack? Try this one on. The next time someone says, well, I'm under attack, say, duh. And your former friend will... <laughs> no, but you're always under attack. Jesus promised that. If you're not under attack, you're probably not walking in Christ. If you're walking in Christ, Satan's going to be coming at you in one way or another. But we're not meant to live under circumstances. We're meant to live in the joy and the peace and the hope of Christ, protected by Him. And pray that God would do that. Pray for yourself. Pray for one another. And when we begin to pray that God would put us on mission and help us to live Christ-focused lives, Christ-centered lives, instead of circumstance-centered lives, we'll begin to see a radical shift in how we live. Now we'll finish this next week, but I hope and pray that you will see this, these truths. And I would encourage you throughout the week to read John 17 and just uh, meditate on it and look at some of these truths and see what God is teaching us in this passage. Father in heaven, I pray that you will do a John 17 work in us. As Christ finished his mission, may we finish ours. Father, if there's anyone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, has never experienced that saving power that puts us on mission, I pray that that person would come to Christ today so that the mission of God would be become theirs but father i pray that we would be on mission with jesus christ and i pray that we would not live under the circumstances of this life of this world but that we would live in the power of jesus christ in whose wonderful glorious and precious name we pray amen let's stand and sing more love to thee O christ more love to thee i'm here